Well, we're joined now from northern Syria by Taqif Sharif, an aid worker and activist who we saw in that report driving an ambulance in Aleppo, and by Yilmaz, who was also in that report. He's a former Dutch soldier who trains and fights alongside foreign jihadists in Syria. And joining us here in the studio, the Conservative MP Brooks Newmark and Sasha Havlicek, Chief Executive of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, and that's a think tank that aims to counter extremism and radicalization. Yilmaz, let me start with you. What is the objective now? Are you fighting to overthrow Assad or are you fighting to create a caliphate all the way to the other side of Iraq? Well, the goal at the moment for me and for many of the fighters that are around me and for many of the groups that are around me is still always getting rid of this, this tyrant, uh, Al-Assad. First and foremost, as soon as he's gone, we can establish Islamic courts and bring those that have committed any what kind of war crimes or whatsoever to justice. So the most important thing for the fighters here, around me at least in this region, is to overthrow Al-Assad. Let, let me just pause you there, Brooks Newmark. That sounds to me in concert with British policy, overthrow the tyrant. Yes, except uh, what's not in concert with uh, British policy is that if something happens to any British citizens, as we saw with Dr. Khan uh, uh, at the end of last year, um, their families will then come to the government and say, hey, can you come and rescue uh, so-and-so who may end up in one of Assad's prisons? So, but is so his jihad justified, therefore? If he's entirely in concert fundamentally with British policy, either that is to overthrow Assad, can we really reject his desire to go on a jihad? You know, it's not up for me to comment on what Dutch policy is. I can comment on British policy. British policy is to discourage British citizens from going over and putting themselves in the line of fire. Do mm. I understand why he's doing it? Has he articulated his position clearly? Absolutely. Right. OK, well, look, let, let's, let's ask you, Takir, you're not a jihadist, but you are obviously uh, working as an aid worker in a jihadi region. Um, do you think jihad is uh, justified? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Um, uh, bad connection. Do you think jihad is justified? Well, uh, I think you can ask Brooks that. He was uh, one of the people that was saying uh, a short while ago that it's time to arm the Syrian rebels and to, to, to bring uh, Assad down. And I'm in complete agreement with him. He also said that instead of seeing 100,000 people dead, by the end of the year, we could see 300,000 people dead. And this is what we have to remember. It's the Syrian population that are paying the price. Innocent civilians are dying every single day. If it was our women and children that were being slaughtered every single day, we wouldn't be sitting here discussing whether it's justified or isn't justified. But, Talkir, things have changed dramatically. There are terrible human rights abuses going on behind the lines in rebel areas. Uh, we see it all the time. Amputations, uh, shootings. Uh, no, no natural justice. Um, th these things are rife, and you know it well. Uh, th the question, therefore, is th the question, therefore, is to you, uh, Yilmaz. Um, is now the only opportunity for you to side up with uh, ISIS? Do, do, you, do you see ISIS as the as the future? Basically, for for me, as 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 a trainer, as a lone wolf. I need to investigate this whole ISIS situation. I'm looking into it as, as the, at the moment. It's, it's, it's too early to, to make a decision as, as of yet. I need to look into it. It's it, it just the, the, the ISIS just came out with a statement. For me, and I, I've always said this, and for many, many foreign fighters, as long as Bashar al-Assad is still doing what he's doing, he's the main goal, he's the main problem. I wish I could bring you guys to, to, to Halep, to Aleppo, to see the barrel bombs and the destruction. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. The media is all about ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. Mm -hmm. What happened to the initial problem of the regime? Mm -hmm. that was, that was, that's still the first problem that we're dealing with here. Well, let's, so, let's, let's just let's ask you one specific question, because yeah. ISIS preaches that Shias, Shia Muslims should be executed en masse. Uh, some of the people you train may well end up shooting Shia Muslims. Is that of justified? Th that's a reality, but, but here's yeah, but another reality. Yeah, but is it reality. acceptable? These Shia 
fighters that, 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 that ISIS is talking about are not just random Shias walking around here in Syria. I've seen Christians, I've seen Druze, I've seen Kurds living in peace within Islamic controlled areas. These Shias that ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusr or Ahrar al-Sham or whichever group here in Syria are talking about are Shia fighters that have volunteered by the thousands to fight here in Syria. These are the Shias that we are talking about mm. in this case. Well, let me pause you there. Uh, Sasha, what do you make of what you've heard so far in terms of de-radicalization? Surely what is happening in this conflict is the radicalization of just about everybody who's involved in it. It's hard not to feel sympathetic uh, towards the humanitarian call to arms that both of these men have talked about. And they're not unusual in the idealism, actually, of many of the young men that we've seen from across the whole of Europe, uh, from North America, going off to fight in Syria in particular. But they are not, um, they, they are unusual in their independence, uh, claimed independence from the various radical groups fighting on the ground. Most kids go out there wishing to do good for these local populations and end up being drawn into extremist organizations that are doing brutal damage to those civil civilian populations. And, and that is true, isn't it, Taukir? It is very, very difficult for a fighter to remain in some way independent from one or other of the groups that is fighting. And the groups I've... that are fighting are becoming more radical by the day. To be honest, I feel that this rhetoric really needs to be changed. Even when you guys introduced me, you said uh, he's in jihadi controlled areas. Uh, there's the Free Syrian Army here. There's so many various different groups. And if we're going to turn around and say that everybody's being radicalized, I I'm a grown man at the end of the day. Many of the people that come here are grown men. We came here to help people who are oppressed. And to try and say that people have come here and now are going to, instead of help oppressed people, are going to start killing them and... And it's a lot of scaremongering, to be honest. Why are we speaking about ISIS when there's uh, war crimes being committed here? That, that, that's why I, I would like to ask. Are you worried within the context of this rhetoric that you, for example, should you wish to come back to Britain, will have problems with your passport, that your family will be, uh, you know, held and uh, there may be great difficulties about returning? Are you worried about that? Of course, I'm very worried. Uh, to be honest, I had many of my friends, many charities that work with were saying to me, don't do this interview. Um, and I said to him, it's about time that somebody needs to speak out. Um, for me, it, something that Martin Luther King said, he said that society's punishments are small compared to uh, the wounds we inflict, uh, inflict on our souls when we turn the other way. And this is the problem now. Society, or, or the British government in fact, I think that most British people understand the problem here. And British values dictate that we really must do something. Well, that's the reason that... why someone like Brooks... Let's... He, he completely put, agrees with taking down Bashar. Hmm. Let's put that to our MP, Brooks Newmar. Look, I, I, uh, Tahir, I, I understand totally what you're saying, and you're really reflecting a lot of the argument that I gave, uh, I guess, almost two years ago now, when I said we must intervene. This is a humanitarian intervention that we must not conflate with Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, Assad is butchering his own people, as you've correctly identified. The numbers will go up, and the unintended consequences of doing nothing and voting against supporting the Free Syria Army and the people of Syria is that we have given space to ISIS that did not exist three years ago and allowed them to flourish. So I still argue the case that we should be doing more to support the Syrian people on the ground so that you do not have to leave Britain to go over and do fighting for the Syrian people. That is the objective that I would seek. Talkir? The question... The question I'd like to ask uh, Brooks is, is if, if that's the stance uh, and how you feel, <clears throat> then why are aid workers like myself being persecuted? Why are many charity organizations being investigated? Why is the word terrorism only prescribed for Muslims? Obviously, you're a Zionist supporter. You know what's going on in Gaza right now. Um, it's a disproportionate um, uh, use of force on the civilian population there. But yet, but we're not speaking about... British fighters who are going and serving in the IDF. But We're Tauke, only speaking Tauke. about maybe 20 Tauke. or 30 or maybe 50 British fighters who may not even possibly be in ISIS. Right, but there's, it's, there's you a know what, where we know you, that something... You know what the fear is, is Taukir. People are going to the IDF. Ta Taukir, the fear... And, and why are they not being radicalized? Taukir. Are they not radicalized? The fear, the fear is that people will come back having experienced this extreme violence that is going <clears> on in this war and will in some way wish to continue the war when they return here. 
okay, what what about Israeli fighters? They, are they not being radicalized by by the extreme violence that they are seeing? Mm. Or is it because this is part of right. our, uh, our well, government policy to, to support Israel and the war crimes that it commits? Okay, the use okay. of The use but, of uh, white phosphorus, um, ch child prisoners in, in Israeli I prisons. In, I, I want to bring in Yilmaz. In Israeli prison. Yeah, I want to bring in Yilmaz. Y Yilmaz, um, how many British fighters do you come across and are, are, what, what sort of role are they performing? Um, right now, uh, there, there are British fighters around me. That are that just want to stay out of the the, the internal problems, etc. Um, some are doing aid work. Others are just just they say I'm I'm laying down my weapon for the moment. Others are still working on the front lines. The British the British brothers here are beautiful brothers. They're dedicated brothers. They're focused brothers. When I hear this about them going back, a brother told me just yesterday how beautiful the, the, the Muslim community was in the UK. This what is not sort of numbers person. are you seeing? What sort of numbers are you seeing? In, in the 30s, in the 40s, it's, it's, yeah, it changes, it changes. I mean, this is, this is the issue. You have, well, according to the security service, at least 450 uh, foreign fighters in the field. In fact, many people think it's many more than that. Um, do you think it's possible for them to go to this war, experience what's happening, there are bad things happening on both sides, and not come back radicalised? That people go for different reasons to fight in these conflicts, there's no question. I think the challenge is that they come back uh, war-hardened, uh, many of them with psychological stresses. Um, th these places are terrible, of course, but they come back with the networks, global jihadi networks, and they come back um, with training. Hmm. There is a real challenge there. There is a real fear. I think that that And it's one that's exacerbated by the existence of ISIS hmm. and, of course, the birth of this caliphate. And isn't that something which, frankly, shivers your timbers? <clears throat> it does. But we, uh, you know, going back to the argument that uh, Tahir made, not, you, know, uh, you know, I am a humanitarian interventionist. I, when I see bad things happen, I call it, whether it's in Israel or, or Iraq or... Syria. So uh, he mustn't conflate an argument in the same way I'm not doing with him. I respect the humanitarian work that you do, uh, Tahir, but what I'm saying is that if, if you as a British citizen get into trouble, your family will come to the government and say, hey, come and rescue me. I am sorry, I'm simply saying uh, here it is our responsibility, and this is the argument I am making in Parliament, that we must support the Free Syria Army and the Syrian National Coalition to go and do the work. If we do not arm them to do the work, more and more people will go from England, will go from Saudi, will go from but, Kuwait to support ISIS, and that's the problem. Yilmaz, is the Free Syrian Army even a serious force? Surely there are much stronger forces there now on the rebel side that probably need arms more than the Free Syrian Army. To, to, be, to, be, to be honest, with, with all due respect towards all groups, of course, the Free Syrian Army in four years hasn't really proven itself as, as, as an effective fighting force. Doesn't have the arms. So, uh, Brooks Newmark is I mean, saying is that that's because they don't have the arms. They haven't got the arms. Can I just come in? They, they haven't had the support, but not just that. The, the other groups, what we know about foreign fighters is that the, the numbers that have been killed, most of them have been killed in infighting between these radical right. groups. That is a real point, Ilmaz, that in fact, most of the foreign fighters that have died in the field have died because of internecine fighting between groups on the ground. There is no order, there is no discipline on your side, and therefore there is no coherent force to arm. Well, I would, I would disagree. I think that there are groups out there that are, that are effective against, against the regime, against al-Assad. The infighting, basically, if, if, if you're constantly on the front lines, putting your life uh, in danger, you're working day in, day out, and, and other groups are, are doing nothing, it, it gets frustrating after a while. And if these groups, for example, from, from whichever outside agenda, uh, just, just turn on you, it, it causes conflict. I mean, I right. mean this, is, this, is a, this is normal. Okay. A final question to you, Turkir. Do you and many of the people you meet want to come back one day and resume a normal life in Britain? Talk here. Sorry, I didn't hear that again. Sorry, it's do, a very do bad you, line. Do you and other people you know there want to return to their own countries one day and live a normal <laughs> life? I, w I would love to return home, but I feel that I will be sitting in a prison cell. Many people that I know have been arrested 
and I would call on the British government and 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 the British population as a whole to change their policies. Schedule Seven uh, is a breach of human rights. Um, all of the anti-terror legislation um, is ostrac ostracizing a whole Muslim community. Mm. And if you continue to ostracize a Muslim community, and I applaud right. and I say Ramadan Kareem to all of the Muslims back in the UK who are an amazing population, eventually somebody is going to lash out. Turkey and, and Brit Brit uh, British, the British government must look at its own Turkey. policies. If you push someone so far back against the wall that he has I no other to, choice. Uh, we have to leave it there, Takia, but thank you both. You and Neil Nurse very much for joining us from Syria. Brooks Newmark, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, and Sasha um, Halvacek, thank you very much indeed for joining us here.